Hello, I'm Pastor Larson. I'm with Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida. When you come to the Lord's Supper, doubts or concerns may arise in your minds concerning Jesus' words. On the contrary, let's investigate together how those words can invite us and even motivate us to come to the supper he instituted. We invite you to our worship services at 8.30 and 10.30 on Sunday morning. We are worshiping in in person uh, with uh, masks and temperature taking and the social distancing. Or, of course, you can always see this on YouTube live at 8.30 and 10.30 or later on if you desire. You can also tune in to our Bible study every Sunday at 10. However, we have moved that to 9.30, and we're going to check on that and see how that is working. Sunday's Bible study is at 10.30, not at 10, as it shows on the screen. I'll have to change that. Do you have any questions, dear people, that are with us today? Do you have any questions about the Lord's Supper that you haven't had a chance to raise yet? I want you to keep in mind that I'm always going to stop occasionally, and instead of asking you questions, I'm going to ask for your questions. All right. I've got an outline of what uh, we could cover today. Uh, the first one is some help in handling the doubts that might arise in our mind when we are waiting to come to the table of the Lord. And to battle against the doubts, we have Lord Jesus, his own words that give us assurance that what we are doing is for us, and it is pleasing in his sight that we come and receive his body and blood. In, with, and under the bread and the wine. When you doubt and you can't get assurance from his words, then maybe it's time to sit down with the pastor or a, a trusted member of our congregation. And the third item is um, a difficult question. It's a pastoral concern of many, if not most pastors. When people stay away from the sacrament a long period of time, one Sunday uh, does not constitute a long period of time. But if someone hasn't been to the supper for three or four months, then we wonder what's going on in their lives that keep them away. And can we in any way listen to them long enough to know what the problem might be and then use the words of the Lord to incite and invite them back to the supper? Well, that's the outline. Let's get started. What if I doubt? The answer to doubt in, in matters of practicing our faith is the same answer. Go back to the Word of God. And in the case of the Lord's Supper, go back to where Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood. And you'll find that recorded in Matthew 26 and Mark 14 and Luke 22 and in 1 Corinthians 11. Now, of course, I give to you these things on the screen and if you're watching on YouTube, you hit the pause button and get your Bibles out and look them up. If you're uh, one of the group of the, in the Bible study, uh, those that are online with us this morning or those who tune in later, I send this to you and you can uh, you have these references in front of you. I'm not printing them out right now. We've already done that in previous times together. So we can deal with doubt. I have over many years dealt with doubt by reading the hymns of Holy Communion that are right there in my hymnal. Now, I learned last week that when you go to worship because of COVID-19 concerns, the hymnals have been removed from the racks. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. I don't know how long the virus would stay on that surface, but we're trying to minimize the chances 
of it I being. I think it has to do with projection from singing. Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. And uh, with mouths wide open, um, well, we just know that could happen. So if you have a hymnal at home, you can, this is the old hymnal, the Lutheran hymnal number 306, stanza five. I've memorized this and it's in my heart. If I have any doubts about how this could be, it looks like bread and wine to me. How this can be, I leave to thee, thy word alone sufficeth me. I trust its truth unfailing. You understand how those words can, mm -hmm. can help you? It's a prayer. All right. What if I doubt? I could take the attitude that helps me very much when the word of God conflicts with my reasoning or with the views of the world or my friends. When my doubt is in the word of God itself, I listened to Luther who said, I know that the Holy Spirit has more wisdom in his little finger than I have in all of my life. <laughs> He's using a personification, of course, for the Holy Spirit, but he is saying there's no way when the Holy Spirit has decided to record these words, I'm going to trust the word of God. That's one of the main themes when you read Luther is his dependence on the word. And I, I don't know how I could emphasize it anymore. St. Paul's words are therefore pertinent. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. You see how that is like a bulwark, a bulwark against the assaults that the devil, the world, and our flesh will throw against our beliefs? Dwell on that word. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion that conspire against the knowledge of God. I'll bet you haven't thought of that passage in that way. What if I doubt? Remember and rehearse the following uh, hymn verse. Now, I'm going to try something because I have it uh, available. <clears throat> you see this? You see this? On, is this on screen? Yes. Yeah, on screen right now. It just has to remember and rehearse the following hymn verse, but no verse. Okay, it's coming. Is that too loud? Yes. just one stanza. It's in our hymnals, the new ones, 636 stanza four. Human reason cannot figure out how Christ's body remains even though for 2,000 years it has sustained the faith and the forgiveness for uncountable people on earth. And when he gives his blood and the wine, he's giving his blood with the wine. It's a mystery that's unsounded. Do you know what that means, unsounded? You know what Mark Twain means? 
That's um, measuring the depth of the water below the surface of the water so that when you're going down a great river like the Mississippi, said Mark Twain, you can, yeah, Mark Twain. <laughs> uh, Samuel Clemens' uh, pen name, Mark Twain, had to do with measuring the depth of the Mississippi or some other river by finding that it is two meters or two yards deep. I don't know what they were, what this unit of measurement was. That's Mark Twain. Well, if you had a weight on a, on a, on a rope, you would run out of rope and you would not be able to sound the depth of the mystery of God. You understand what the poet is writing about here? It's such a great mystery that though you had the longest rope, you could not get down to the depth of this mystery. No way we can figure, we humanly can figure it out. That's right. And he has decided, I won't explain it to you. I'll just give it to you. And I want you to believe my word. So if you ever doubt, find this hymn, copy it out of the internet, print it out, um, put it in your um, notebook or your purse or wallet. It is, it is a great help to me. That's all I wanted to do with that hymn. I didn't want to, to sing it this morning, but I put the music behind it so that the memory of the, of the stanza would be with you. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. All right. You can go back to this when you receive it. And chances are good that when you read it to yourself at home, the music memory will come back to you. All right, let's go on. What if I doubt? The Lord's Supper makes the assurance of forgiveness doubly sure. How is that so? Well, first of all, it tells us the words given and shed for you for the remission of sins. That's what he said. That's what he said, and I believe it. Jesus. And the second thing is he gives us his body and blood as a pledge and seal of our forgiveness. What, what greater gift could he give? After giving himself, he goes on giving us every time we receive the Lord's Supper. It's a gift that no one in the world would ever dream of giving us. So it's his idea, and it must be good for us, or he wouldn't say, do this in remembrance of me. What if a person stays away from the supper for a long time? Have you ever known anyone who came to church but didn't commune? You just noticed? Don't say their names, of course. But have you ever noticed anyone staying in their pews? Though they were a member. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry that I uh, was not careful in uh, my right margin today, and I imagine some of you are losing some of the words. I'm sorry about that. I forgot that I must change the margin. <coughs> Excuse me. I coughed into my elbow. Well, what about that person that we care about. Should that person be compelled to partake? I'm reading from Martin Luther's large catechism. No one should by any means be coerced or compelled. He means go to the supper. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, it must be known that such people as deprive themselves of and withdraw from the sacrament so long a time are not to be considered Christians. Does that sound harsh to you? Yeah, that sounds real harsh. How can you say to the Lord Jesus, I will not partake of the supper? 
Well, I think doesn't unworthiness come in there or something that's really laying heavy on your heart? Well, those are two separate things and let me take them one at a time. The unworthiness we talked about a couple of times ago has to do with my feeling of, of uh, guilt or sin mm-hmm. <clears throat> that I am not worthy. And remember, what does in what does worthiness consist? Faith in these words given and shed for you for the remission of sins. Correct. The worthiness is the person who has examined themselves. I have trouble with the plural sometimes. People who have examined themselves and do not believe that they receive the Lord's body and blood in the sacrament are going to take and eat to their judgment. 1 Corinthians 11, 28 and 29. Okay, that's the worthiness. Now, the other case, which is more of a pastoral concern, I suppose, and that is, uh, pardon me, all right, Um, that concern that a pastor has, that a person has such guilt that they know they should not stay away. I would encourage that person to come to the supper with a repentant heart. If there is no repentance, no intent of the mind and heart to stop that sin, of which they receive forgiveness and then go back to the same sin intentionally, then that person might stay away until such a time as that person repents of that sin. And that means stop it. Sins of weakness make us very difficult to confront that. Suppose a person had the the sin of constant anger. Well, let's resolve those angers and repent of them and then come to the supper for forgiveness. Now, I had a question that crossed my desk this past week, early week, I guess it was. If I don't come to the supper, am I still forgiven? (laughs) Of course you are. If I don't commune for four weeks or two weeks, do I have to worry about not being forgiven in the days that are in between? Of course not. You are forgiven every day. And that forgiveness is not time bound, but it is forever. Uh, Christ does not withhold his forgiveness except from those who refuse to repent. And that has never changed. That's Old Testament and New Testament. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish, are the words of our Lord. Yeah, and that was when the Tower of Siloam fell on those people, and they wondered if they were greater sinners than the ones asking the question. No. You will also likewise perish if you do not, if you do not repent. Okay, and that's why if someone stays away from the supper, I want to know why really having a trouble with that frog this morning like some of you are. I'm very sorry about that. I did take a throat lozenge early on. Let's try to stay on point here. Did that answer your question? Um, I, I think so. Um, I mean, we also now have situations where people have been confined to their home. I mean, this is a extraordinary uh, uh, with the COVID and uh, and bringing communion I know to them has you know sometimes been uh, an obstacle although our church has worked it out people just need to ask and an elder my understanding would bring consecrated uh, communion to them right right but this sentence means people who deprive themselves they withdraw it's not in the case you're talking about through no fault of their own. 
No, it's a conscious, it's a conscious withdrawal. Is that what we're saying basically? Yes. They're okay, a conscious withdrawal. People stay away intentionally. Intentionally, okay, that's a good word. Now, they may not even be in the pew. But pastor, I still believe, what do you believe? I believe Jesus died for my sins. Oh, good, wonderful. What I'm going to do, dear people, is um, ask you to. Uh, well, we're going to we're going to continue with this with this subject. So we care about those people. We care deeply about those people who don't come to church anymore, and there are thousands of them, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, of people who stay away from the Lord. And there are many reasons. That is a book-length answer I won't try to conquer this morning. All right. <clears throat> what if a person stays away for a long time? They might say, are we not free to partake or not partake? Would someone, starting with Judy, read what Luther says to people or about people who take their liberty and sin against the Lord in this way. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I've kind of lost the right part of my screen, so you might have to finish what, sentence. Uh, for me. Can you see this word for? For, yes. Well, you've got it all then. Okay. Uh, what if a person stays away from the supper for a long time? Are we not free to partake? or not partake, it is not left free in the sense that we may despise it, for, for that I call despising it if one allows, allows so long a time to elapse and with nothing to hinder him, yet never feel a desire for it. If you wish such liberty, you may just as well have the liberty to be no Christian and neither have to believe, no, no, nor nor pray for the one is just as much the command of Christ as the other. How does that go, go down? That's Luther's pastoral heart. It's kind of an ouch. Well, he, he does leave in, if nothing to hinder. Yes. We can use that as the, um, right. That means if you're yeah. sick or it's not available, or it's 1829 uh, and you're living in, um, let's say, Arkansas, and there are no churches within 150 miles. That's quite a horse ride. Mm -hmm. You understand there are times in every country where the sacrament is just not available. No pastors around. Well, that's probably very true in many countries today right now, especially those that have been persecuted or we've lost many Christians due to persecution and killings. That's right. Let's go on with the same, uh, <clears throat> same theme. What if a person stays away from the supper a long t uh, time? That's the same question. And here's another answer from the large catechism, Martin Luther. See, what sort of Christian I am? If I were one, I would certainly have some longing for that which my Lord has commanded me to do. Does it sound sarcastic? <laughs> yeah, it does. Luther could be very sarcastic in order to get his point across. <laughs> He's you have to understand the time in which he lived when people were so free from the Roman Catholic domineering presence that now they were free to do nothing at all. They were free from doing works because, well, Martin Luther preached it was not by works that I'm saved. You see how they took their liberties and made it license? And they swung the other direction too far. <laughs> That's right. And they threw away uh, the icons in the church because they were afraid that they uh, committed sins against the first commandment or the second commandment, I should say, and depending on how you number them. <clears throat> yeah. I just, I'm going to take my liberty. 
And I want to stay on this subject. What's the problem with staying away from the for a long time? Who else will read here if a person thus? I will, and then I guess Corolla. Um, so if a person thus withdraws from this sacrament, he will daily become more and more callous and cold and will at last disregard it altogether. To avoid this, we must indeed examine heart and conscience and act like a person who desires to be right with God. Now, the more this is done, the, heart warmed and the more will the heart be warmed and enkindled that it may not become entirely cold. If you take a log away from the fire, eventually <clears throat> the fire in that log will die out. Hmm. But it is the communion of saints, the getting together in one uh, uh, fire where the Holy Spirit is speaking through the word. I know I mixed my metaphors. <laughs> But if you stay away and don't examine your heart and your conscience, you're acting like a person who doesn't want to be right with God. That is unrighteousness. Because it, here's the way I'll put it. So if you miss a meal, that probably be as okay. If you miss two meals, I suppose you can live just fine the next day. But if you miss 21 meals and you're not otherwise ill, well, something is going to begin happening uh, to your body, deprived of its nutrients and water <clears throat> and other things. If you stay away from the food that God has given you in the supper, how can you continue to live in your faith? I know, unless you're otherwise uh, d deprived or find it unavailable. That's, that's totally different because it's no longer a sin. I understand. It's mm -hmm. actually a sin to not eat. <laughs> that's a long story I'm not going to tell now. But to, to, to go on a, on a fast with no intention of returning to eat is a way of self-destruction. If you withdraw from the sacrament, you are depriving yourself of what God wants you to have. And the more you do this, the more you don't care about it. I have something else. To answer the question, what if a person stays away from the supper a long time, believing that committing a particular sin makes a barrier to partaking? Ah, oh, that's a little bit different, isn't it? Committing a particular sin. Corolla, would you read that? Yes. What if a person stays away from the supper for a long time, believing that committing a particular sin makes a barrier to partaking? If anyone have not committed sin for which we can rightly be put out of the congregation and esteemed as no Christian, he ought not to stay away from the sacrament, lest he may deprive himself of life. You understand what, uh, now here Luther is quoting. Oh, I have trouble the, understanding that. The teacher, St. Hilary, with one L. If you... If a person did commit a sin which would result in his excommunication, well, that person would be staying away from the sacrament, obviously. So if you're a member and the sin you have committed would not be one that would excommunicate you, the, the list is rather short, that person ought not to stay away from the sacrament. When I reword it and paraphrase it, I hope that makes it easier to understand. Everyone okay with that? The ancient writing often has double negatives. And I learned in grade school, when you don't understand a double negative, which you weren't supposed to have in the first place, but when you read these ancient writers, you find the double negative and they do that for emphasis. 
So what I learned from my teacher in grade school was, if you don't understand it with the double negative, cross out both ne ne double negatives, and it becomes a positive. You remember that? No. You don't? Okay. <laughs> it's okay if you don't. I, I told you, when I teach uh, the Bible, I teach uh, grammar and punctuation as well as... Uh, anything else that relates to the word and esteemed as no okay so we have a not here and we have a no and not stay away and even the less is a is a shade of a of a contrast okay if the sin you've committed is not one that would excommunicate you come to the come to the supper that's the way i would say it today Someone uh, who else is uh, up for reading today? I think that's it. I think for that's it today. Chris? I, I'll do it and then Judy. Um, that, okay, what if a person stays away from the supper for a long time? What would Christ say to that person? They that be whole need not a physician, but they that be sick that is, those who are weary and heavy laden with their sins, with the fear of death, temptation of the flesh, and of the devil. Is there more after that? That's all I see. Seems like there should be another sentence. Pastor, you're muted. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I had another coughing spell. Oh, sorry. What would Jesus say to a person that was afraid they uh, afraid to come to the sacrament because of their sin? And Jesus would issue the invitation. I came for those who are sick and heavy laden. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm spending too much time on these slides. Well, here another long one, okay. Judy. The Lord's Supper. What if a person stays away from the supper for a long time, believing partaking of the sacrament would bring harm? According to the words of St. Paul, anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. 1 Corinthians 11, 29 to 30. We must never regard the sacrament as something injurious from which we had better flee, but as a pure, pure, wholesome, comforting remedy imparting salvation, comfort and, and comfort, which will cure you and give you life, both in soul and body. Thank you. Do you uh, have comments on this one? I know you have probably read a few times about St. Paul's warning to those who were coming to the supper without discerning the body, without discerning that the body was present and received in the supper. And some were weak and ill, and some have, King James has fallen asleep, a euphemism for those who had died. The problem in 1 Corinthians and uh, that's both uh, 10 and 11, was people coming to the supper and eating and not waiting for those who would come later and didn't have much to eat. Their sin was great. And there was no repentance in their hearts against their sin of being selfish and unconcerning uh, toward those who had little. It wasn't designed to be a potluck supper, but you know, the idea was there. Hmm. Well, if you read that, you might say, well, I'm afraid that I might be guilty. So I'm going to stay away. Have you ever thought that or knew anyone who thought that? I, I never even thought of that, you know, this whole statement. You mean 1 Corinthians 11? Yeah. I'm concerned that uh, people aren't aware of this, and yet my pastoral heart says, well, maybe it's good that... <laughs> would anybody stay away because they thought they would suffer harm? 
Would would anybody, I mean, this is a real long shot. Would anybody think of the Lord's Supper as cannibalism? Well, that's, exactly. Yeah. That's what um, people who were against Martin Luther's teaching, the Bible's teaching, who were against the true body and blood of Christ received in the sacrament, they accused the Lutherans of being cannibals. Okay. So that's not a new thing. But some people believed that to their harm. Now here's what should happen. If anybody is afraid of this sentence, drinking judgment and having some bodily affliction or worse, the answer to that is believe the Lord's words and don't sin against the body and blood of Christ. Believe that you do receive the body and blood. Go ahead, Chris. Oh, um, you, do you want me to read? No, I, I, you sounded like you had a concern or question. No, I didn't. I'm sorry. Okay, I heard your voice. Yeah. Because I can't see hands raised. Actually, there is a way to raise hands in here. I haven't shown you that. Uh, because people have this concern, they might stay away. And the answer is, believe the Lord's words. And then this is food for the soul. That's all we're trying to say here. Yes. What I'm doing by giving you Luther's words is giving you my words. If I were a great writer and teaching the congregation today, I would love to have these same words uh, taught. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Even though five centuries have passed, or nearly so, in uh, 2029, we'll celebrate the 500th anniversary of the Catechism. <laughs> All right. Well, what if I just say, I'm free to partake or not to partake? What's the answer to that, according to Martin Luther in paragraph 70? Carola, I think you're up. Who? Who is that? Carola. Carola. Carola, would you read that? The Lord's Supper? Yes. Just say, I am free, what? I am free to partake or not partake? Yes. yes. What if that's so? The part of God both the command and the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ. Besides this, on your part, your own distress, which is about your neck, and because of which this command, invitation, and promise are given, ought to impel you. What ought to bring us to the supper is... Ought to impel you. Impel you. We, we don't go to the supper just because it's time. Okay, today's the Lord's Supper. I'm going to go. No, I go because of my great need. In part. This is what Luther is saying. And this is what I would say to you. To prepare for the sacrament, go back to the 20 questions that I sent to you last week. To prepare for the Lord's Supper, go back and read Jesus' words in those chapters. Now, do you have any remaining questions about, about the Lord's Supper? I have a few, but I wanted to pause. <clears throat> any remaining questions about the Lord's Thank Supper? Any remaining Lord's Supper? Mm. Okay. Now, if you received instruction in the Christian faith, when you were a teenager and maybe even before if you were brought up in a Lutheran school you had the six chief parts and the sixth part was the sacrament of the altar as the head of the family you should teach it in a simple way to his household the first question what is the sacrament of the altar holy communion, holy communion. And you probably memorize this. It is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ under the bread and wine instituted by Christ himself for us Christians to eat and to drink. 
the second question, where is this written? Well, we know the answer in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and St. Paul. I gave you those references. Mm -hmm. And what did Jesus say? On the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Take eat, this is my body, which is given for you. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of the New Testament. My blood, which is Those words might be slightly different yes. from uh, what did you have and I had the... Probably King James. Um, had the 1943 Catechism. Yeah. And it had a blue cover. And it was about four inches by five or six inches. I have one in my library. What is the benefit of this eating and drinking? I have a question, Pastor. Yes. So um, the Lord's Supper is is given by an ordained pastor right. or a Lutheran pastor. Um, so what about these people that maybe lived 150 miles from a church or something like that? Is if where where is can anybody substitute? Uh, not normally, no. Um, I can answer that. Uh, it happened in our in the history of our country when mission churches were established way out away from the major cities where pastors were. Um, they had a circuit pastor who would ride on horseback or carriage of some kind and go from town to town. He would preach in his own church on Sunday and on Monday night he would preach in a town 150 miles away and then he would go to the next town and they would give him lodging and food as he served that congregation on another day. And by the end of the week, he had completed his circuit and he was back in his own parish. It was rough, but they did it out of love for the people. And they came to that congregation, which was small and probably housed in someone's home. And they gave the sacrament to those people. And weeks might go by, especially in bad weather, before they, that pastor was able to come again. What I'm saying is a compilation of many stories which have been told over the years. I don't know of any one in particular. It also happens during times of persecution. And here's the answer to that. It's not a direct answer to your question. I understand your question. But let me say this. We can live without the sacrament, so long as the gospel continues to be preached and taught. Hmm. Now, that isn't the Lord's intent, but you're not staying away from your intent. You're staying away because it isn't provided. You know, how can mom accuse you of not eating if she never serves you? Mm -hmm. To use a human example. Good point. So here is the Lord wanting you to have it and establishing the means. Now, your real question is one that was asked a week or two ago, and that was about the consecration. And I've thought about that a lot since someone asked it, and I, I care about the question because it's coming up again and again in our world uh, because of what's going on. Well, it is established partially because God established the priesthood in the Old Testament. And the priesthood was responsible for one thing in particular, and that was for making the sacrifice, for bringing the sacrifice to the altar. All right? And only the priest could do this. No one else. And that was the Lord's doing, the Lord's word, his, his intention. And it was carried out. All right, so we get into the New Testament, and there were still priests, weren't there? They weren't faithful, most of them. 
Well, they were still responsible for going into the temple and making the prayers. Uh, Zechariah was one of those. The turn came for, for him to go in, you know, and because he didn't believe the Lord's word, he was struck mute until... Now, I see a bad spelling error there. No, it's okay. Uh, it just looked funny. Pardon my interruption of myself. So now we go into the New Testament, and the Lord establishes the, the ministry. He establishes the ministry by calling certain ones to do these things which the priests were doing, to preach the word and to administer the sacrament. Now that particular command is kind of hidden from us. It comes up in St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. And that's where St. Paul says, this is how you ought to regard us as servants of the mysteries of God. The mysteries of God included the mystery of the Lord's Supper. St. Paul was not the owner or the director, but only a steward of that and other mysteries. And he taught those. Now, St. Paul, to be sure, was never a, a pastor of a church. He established churches, and then he ordained, well, I'm using a modern word, he placed pastors into various churches. And we see that example in uh, Timothy and, and Titus. So we can read those letters to see how the ministry continued the ordained or appointed ministers of the word continued. So that continues all the way through the centuries. It isn't something that we pastors hold on to as ours and withhold it the privilege and the responsibility from others. When a pastor administers the Lord's Supper, he is doing more than passing out bread and wine. Well, of course, he's passing out the body and blood of Jesus. Yes, he is doing that and more than that. If a pastor is responsible for the souls of that parish, he should know the spiritual condition of that parish and of the people in that parish. And that is very difficult in a large congregation. Hmm. Yes, it is. But when people bring to him their cares, concerns, and sins of which they are, are, are terribly troubled, then he absolves them privately. That used to happen a lot more a century ago. I'm sorry it doesn't happen a lot anymore. It isn't that people are sinning less. Oh, no. But I find that people who sin intentionally stay away more and more and finally absent themselves from worship altogether. I believe that one of the number one reasons that people stay away from worship is some sin that they do not want to give up. And they know it. And the guilt remains. Well, you can make excuses for them. I can understand that because I stayed away from, the, from worship for almost three years when I was a teenager. I've told you that story before, I know. But it helps me understand that I didn't even seek a way to go back to worship after moving to Michigan and living with my father and my grandmother, neither one of which worshipped. You see, I had a bad example. Well, we didn't have a car, and I had, I had another half dozen excuses. <laughs> they didn't hold any water. No one came to me because no pastor was responsible for my care. I had left the parish in Illinois where I was confirmed. I stayed away. But when I came to the University of Michigan in 1960, I learned of a beautiful place. And this beautiful place was where 
Lutheran students and Lutheran pastors gathered every Sunday. A Missouri Synod established congregation of like-minded people in the same kind of community. And I ran there. It was about a six block walk. Well, we did a lot of walking in Ann Arbor, Michigan. <laughs> uh, most of the time it was pretty good. But I learned to love that community and find that that community loved me. But it's not only the pastor's responsibility to go out and seek those that have strayed away up That's either. Right. That's right. When you see a lost sheep, remind them where the the pen is. <laughs> yeah. The pen is a bad word, but the sheepfold. Remind them that the pastor cares about them. I say this to you with all my heart, that you care for those who have stayed away. And you have to listen to them for a long time and dispel of their, uh, let them have their bad, bad excuses for a while. Just let them pour them out. Because some of them have been hurt. Yes. And uh, that needs to be resolved and forgiven. And sadly, sometimes it's a rift that they have had with the pastor and the church and so sometimes I think that's where a fellow Christian can certainly go out and probably uh, meet them one-on-one -on -one a lot easier sometimes. Be more effective. I had that experience in St. Paul, Minnesota, when yes. I took a course there uh, called Ministry to Inactives. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, we're running out of time. I, my stopwatch is not able to tell me how long we've been recording. So I'm going to have to close here. But uh, I'm going to tell you this, that the pastor of a church, in order to involve us in ministry to inactives, the mm -hmm. lab part of this course, I use the word lab in quotes, was to go out and do such visitations on those who had been away for three years or more. Mm -hmm. You'd say, well, there's little, little hope of that changing. Uh, no, there is hope. And uh, we went out and, you see, we didn't tell them that we were pastors. <laughs> we just said the pastor of St. John's Lutheran asked me to make a call and see how you were doing. And then we had to write a verbatim of what happened in that, in that interview, about 20 minutes, half an hour maybe, and turn it into the class with names taken away. So it's a hard thing, and uh, we're never done with this. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad for your question. I'm going to make a mark where uh, we, we ended here, and uh, I have just a couple more things to cover, and then we'll go on to a new subject. Okay, and that'll be good for us all. But this is important that we know what Jesus has said and believe what Jesus has said, given and shed for you. And I, I want you to believe that you in the singular. Gracious God, attend our ways and when our ways are contrary to your ways, correct us, discipline us. And when we come back repentant and sorrowful because of our real sin, please direct us to the cross where we see our sins nailed and we see the Son of Man taking on the sin of the world, that we might not only have forgiveness for ourselves, but also announce that forgiveness to others who may have stayed away for various reasons. We invite them back and we invite them in the name of Jesus who died for us that we might be here for him and for those he calls. Amen. 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 Well, where's the... Amen. I think I have stopped.